now, you might get a little pop-up. And welcome to those of you who are joining us on YouTube now. I want to thank Bedrock Earthscapes for sponsoring our webinar today and providing their, uh, Bill, what's your title again? Or, or owner, right? I'm just the owner. Just Yeah, just the owner. owner that's all. Yep. <laughs> of Bedrock Earthscapes. We're a small company. <laughs> yeah, but a great friend of TCF, and we do want to thank you for sponsoring our webinars today. So um, sponsors like Bedrock help us to keep these webinars free for everybody. Contact me for more information on sponsoring if you own a company or are part of a company that would be interested in sponsoring our webinar series. You help us to keep these free. And also, after this webinar, you'll be taken to a page with a bunch of resources of things you might be interested in, such as our native plant guide, rain barrel information, and so much more, uh, including our virtual tip jar and our uh, donation button. If you're enjoying these webinars, I do encourage you to donate because that also helps TCF to continue to do all the awesome stuff that we do because we do so much more than just webinars. Uh, if you become a member, then you can also enjoy our wide variety of members only stuff. Uh, keep a lookout for the announcement for our virtual Earth Day benefits. We're going to be doing some small in-person gatherings. Uh, we've got a trivia night coming up. More information on that trivia night hosted by yours truly. Um, and that's going to be really, really fun. So if you've been coming to these webinars, you may have a leg up already on some of those trivia answers. Um, and it's going to culminate in a large virtual event that is not to be missed. So upcoming webinars, as I mentioned, we've been doing these every week for the last year. It has been a year that we've been doing these. It's awesome. Um, on March 17th, we're going to be joined by Amanda Arnold, who's going to be talking about planning your rain garden. So if you are thinking about adding a rain garden to your landscaping this year, it's a great time to start thinking about it. And Amanda will show you how to plan it. And then um, the following week, I will be doing our Conservation at Home 101. That'll be our introductory class yet again on um, how to become part of our Conservation at Home program, how to get your yard certified, and all of that kind of wonderful stuff. So thank you, everybody, for signing in today. And with that, I am going to turn it over to our wonderful friend, Bill Bedrosian. And Bill, why don't you take it away? All right. Well, thank you, Jamie. And thank you for everybody for attending today. I'm looking forward to sharing with you a little bit about native plant best management practices that work well and look great. Um, you know, we, I think, have come a long way in the last 20 years with using native plants, educating people, um, letting people know the value of them. So I know that I'll be talking to the choir a little bit today and that you're familiar with a lot of these things, but uh, I'll begin and end by saying thank you for your involvement, interest, and promotion of these things. I think it's making a difference in enriching life through improving our environment, which is what we do and which I know most of you are interested in doing as well. Okay, now I just gotta make sure I can get the slide to move. There we go. Okay, so we're going to talk about today the use of native plantings, why we use them, where we use them, and, you know, once the conversion is made, well, how do we do the conversion, and then how are they maintained? There might be a little pause between, let's see here. Okay, so let's start with why we use native plants, and I'm just showing you this picture uh, on the lower right of an after planting. So the upper left is killed turf that's being drilled with native seed. And then three years later, this is what you're looking at on the lower right. Um, and across the driveway, you'll see that island is all native grasses. So we'll talk about some different places to use different mixes and different types of plants. But certainly to me, it's much more attractive lower cost to maintain. Why would I want something that looks like the upper left when I could have something that looks like the lower right and provide so much benefit as far as cleaning and filtering our water, providing habitat for pollinators and small animals, 
to me is just, there's no other choice. So some of the benefits that you're probably aware of, I've grouped these into three major areas, use, cost, and environmental benefits. So, you know, in the past, people wanted their parks and their open areas for active recreation. They wanted to play baseball or soccer, or, you know, they wanted to go out and do something active. But a lot of people today appreciate passive recreation. They want to go out and look for pollinators or look for birds or just take a walk by the pond for peace of mind and for, you know, mental health. So these native areas provide a pleasing aesthetic throughout the year. They change it with each season. I'll show you some pictures of that later on. So really passive use of our open areas has become a very um, positive benefit and one of the leading reasons why, you know, we want to use these natives more. Certainly cost and resource stewardship is important. I mean, we don't have to mow those areas 22 to 27 times, burning fuel, man hours, you know, that reduces our cost significantly. We don't have to fertilize them and apply water to irrigate them and so forth. So it also reduces, can reduce if we use native plants as green infrastructure, then we can reduce the cost of our gray infrastructure, concrete and things like that. And so it can reduce the capital cost and the investment in development as well in some cases. So cost and steward, uh, resource stewardship, and then finally the environmental benefits that really has been most marketed in the past, which is reduction of runoff to help reduce flooding downstream, enhanced infiltration, taking pollutants out of the water that falls on the ground, collects pollutants, and then runs down to what we call wetland areas. You know, so it cleanses, cools, and filters that, and it sequesters carbon through its roots because we're not plowing it and turning it over and releasing carbon. We're actually putting it in and keeping it in the ground. It helps to moderate temperature. You know, we each might think a little differently about climate change. My own take on climate change is I don't, you know, I, I think man is affecting it, but I not so sure it's the carbon. I almost think that what we've done, you know, we've changed 95% of the surface of the continental United States since we've settled it in 200 years. I think what we're doing through our agriculture and through our paving and through our turf areas is we're not allowing the surface of the earth to sweat anymore. And if you couldn't sweat, you'd get a heat stroke. And I think that's part of what's happening to the earth is it can no longer give off moisture to have the breeze go across and cool it. But if you look at native areas, even in a drought period, native areas are a net accumulator of moisture. They'll take moisture out of the air in the morning dew and move it down into the soil and have a net accumulation of moisture even in a drought period. And then when that hot wind blows, it can give up some of that moisture to cool the air and to, and to cool the environment, which we've lost throughout most of the rest of the surface of the United States. And we're getting to that point around the world. So temperature and moisture moderation, I think is a very important one that we've overlooked. And then enhanced biodiversity and habitat quality. A lot of people are interested in these because of the pollinators that they support. So let's just take a minute to look a little bit at the background regarding water, soil, plants, and people. You know, this is what the historical pattern of rainfall looked like. If you look at the graphic down below, you'll see the clouds with the graphic of rainwater dropping down on top of the hill. But guess what? It doesn't run down the hill, does it, to where the wetland is. It runs into the soil. It's infiltrating and then it passes through the soil and comes out in the wetland. And when it used to come out in those wetlands, it would come out at a constant temperature, a constant rate, and a constant chemistry. And so those wetlands were a discharge area. That's where the water came out into, right? With a constant chemistry. So today, this is what you have. It might take a minute for your slide to come up. But if you look at this now, look at where the rain falls. It goes across the surface with that brown dotted line and 
fills in what we call wetlands, right? We dig a hole in the ground, we call them a detention area. We wash the water across the surface. It collects pollutants, it collects heat, it collects sediment. We flush it into a depression in the ground. The depression fills with dirty, heated, polluted water, bounces up, and then over a period of time, we allow it to drain out of the sky ordinance that it did before, and then eventually it goes back down again. Next time it rains, guess what? Same thing happens again. The dirty water level heated up, bounces up again. So no longer do you have a constant water level at a constant temperature with a constant chemistry. You have this greasy, dirty, salty water going into these low areas that we create and the water bounces up and down. So why is that important? Well, that's important because Plants will only grow in habitats to which they're adapted. When the water used to come out of the ground at a constant temperature in chemistry, there are plants adapted to that. There are emergent plants, there are wetland edge plants, there are wet prairie plants. They're all adapted to that. You know, what plants are adapted to bouncing dirty water? <laughs> there wasn't bouncing dirty water, so not too many, right? Cattails, Phragmites, reed canary grass. You know, that's typically what you end up with. And that's why you're constantly fighting those things because the habitat for the plants aren't good. And the more you decide where you're gonna plant the plants rather than letting the plants decide where they wanna grow, the more likely you are to have failure in your plantings. So that's another reason to think about not only what you plant, but how you plant it and where you plant them. So we're really recreating native plantings in the built environment and in disturbed areas and in disturbed soils. So, you know, oftentimes we think if we just lay this stuff across the surface, it'll be wonderful. Well, we've also disturbed the soils and there's, you know, a physical, a chemical and a living portion of that soil. But if we don't take that into consideration, the plants may not do well either. So, it, you know, it gets a little more complicated and it just, it's always, it makes life very interesting as well to keep watching and learning and seeing where these things grow and how they grow and so forth. So where are some of the native plants used for best stormwater best management practice? Well, they can be used in educational gardens. Butterfly or pollinator gardens are great places. They're close to sidewalks. People can look at them. They actually see it. I mean, they see actually see butterflies on these plants. They see pollinators, you know, busy as all get out growing on these native plants or living on the native plants. We can use them for rain gardens to help, you know, catch and absorb water at home. You know, 85% of our rainfalls are one inch or less. And we can capture and keep that rainfall on each of our properties, on our homes, on our workplaces, in our communities. We can keep that rain and let it fall and penetrate back into the ground. If we can do that on 85% of our rainfalls, we can stop a lot of this localized flooding. Certainly when we get heavy rains, a rain garden is not going to help, you know, is not going to capture that and stop us from downstream flooding. You know, we have to look at the whole ecosystem to, to do that, the whole water treatment train to do that. But rain gardens can help. Vegetated swales are another place that can start to filter and cleanse and cool that water before it goes into the ground. You know, what are difficult places to mow? If you have a park district or an HOA where for half of the spring you can't get in there because it's too wet. If it's never used, if, if it's too wet to mow, it's too wet to use. So if it's not usable, why keep mowing it? Why don't you consider putting it into wet prairie plants or wetland plants or something and create a nice beautiful native area instead of fighting it all the time? How about pond banks or hillsides? Same thing, if it's, if it's wet, you put a mower on there, you slide down into the pond. You know, a lot, of the, a lot of the folks don't like mowing close to the water edge because they've gone into the pond once or twice. And so, you know, that's another place for safety, but also for appearance, and then to hold your pond bank so they don't erode away, you know, is another, another use for these. Marginal areas to reduce mowing time, if you're not using them, Certainly woodlands have degraded over time. We can clean those up and make them more functional and more beautiful. You know, people think that these thickets that they see today are what a woodland should look like. It's covered with understory and it's solid and you can't see through it. And then when you go in to clean it out, they say, oh, you're, you know, you're destroying it. Well, we're not destroying it. 
You know, historical woodlands are fairly open underneath. You know, it only takes a 10% understory cover for all the desirable bird species that we want to survive. We don't need a 100% thicket under there covering these things. So we're not destroying ecosystems for beneficial birds and, and organisms when we clean up our woodlands. We're actually helping them by removing non-desirable plants. And then your wetlands, you know, if we don't work on them or maintain them, they're just going to degrade into cattails, into phragmites, into reed canary grass, because a lot of our wetlands today are not truly historical wetlands. They're created wetlands, which are a totally different environment. So just keep in mind that use of native plants is only one part of the whole water treatment train, right? You can begin with porous pavements. You can harvest uh, rainwater and use it for flushing toilets or for uh, irrigating lawns or for you know, a variety of purposes. You know, green roof systems, they're fairly expensive as are green wall systems, but they have a purpose, you know, in cooling the air, cooling your roof temperatures, reducing your HVAC costs, capturing, you know, all those one inch rainfalls so it doesn't go off the property. If you're, you know, 100% paved like you are in a city, green roofs might be a solution. How about bioretention systems? Oftentimes, if you read about these things, you'll see where people take their downspouts and they put them into a raised planter that catches all that water and then slowly releases the plants that are growing there. So there's a lot of ways that we can stop from, use to, from treating rain as a waste product. It's clean water. And you know if only 1% of the water on the earth is potable, you know, why would we be wasting it and treating it as a waste product? It just doesn't make sense. So that's where late native landscape systems come in in this overall water treatment train. So this is one example of what I would call a current typical landscape, paved roadways, asphalt, concrete sidewalks, brick spout that doesn't daylight. It goes into a pipe that goes down into the storm line. You can see the manhole cover right there in the middle of the sidewalk. Right, we have neatly mowed turf, neatly trimmed tree ring covered with mulch. Right, and what happens when it rains? Right, the, you get a little bit of shading over there on the driveway right now, but typically that's generating heat. Right, and when it rains, it's collected in the gutter, put into a pipe, and shunted off of the surface. None of it's taken advantage of. But if you were to put some of the practices in place that I talked about, right, we added a few more trees over to the right there to shade the building. The roadways and the sidewalks come into pervious pavement that the water is then moved over to the left side of that brick wall into rain gardens. The downspouts are opened up to a surface swale or gunnel that also feeds into those, those uh, um, rain gardens. So now we've got water moving back into the soil where it falls, greening this campus back up instead of drying it out and browning it up. So if we can incorporate a lot of these principles in the upfront design or when capital improvements are made, they really do not cost any more than what we now call traditional practices of handling stormwater. So let's take a look at some of these different practices, right? Rain gardens. Are you going to use an engineered rain garden or are you just going to put it in native soil? On the left is kind of a graphic of an engineered one, although a very simple one. This is simply a low area that's filled with a sand compost mix, you know, and then planted. And on the right, this is just native soil. It was a low area in this park that was then converted to a rain garden in the native soil. And I'd like you to think about this for a minute. Water not only moves vertically, but it also moves horizontally. And if you layer your soil, water will first move horizontally before it moves vertically down into the soil. And water not only moves down in the soil, but it also moves back up through the soil through capillary action. So when you get a rainfall and the water goes into the ground, how do those plants get water for the, it doesn't rain anymore? It's through capillary action, right? They suck that water up through their roots and then the water moves through the soil through capillary action to the plants. If you put a layer of sand in your soil and remember the principle, it's gonna move horizontally before it moves vertically, you break that capillary action. I have, I have rain gardens and parking lots where 
the soil was excavated, they filled it with this sand organic matter mix. And you know what happens in the summertime when it doesn't rain? It becomes a desert. So we're planting these rain gardens with wet plants and it's a desert when it doesn't rain because of the seed of the soil mix that's been imported into there. So when you think about these engineered structures, you really need to consider how they're built so that that, that doesn't happen because they're being planted with wetland plants and they end up in a desert and they all die. So my preference is to use native soils, plant your natives right into the native soils, let those native plant roots penetrate down that 10 or 12 or 15 feet that they can do to move that water up and down rather than use, using an engineered type of a rain garden structure. I'm not to say that that's not always the place, right? Sometimes because of the limitations, the engineered type of a design is needed and you need some storage underneath. And I'll show you that here with these bioswales. So when this slide comes up, your bioswale here on the left, you'll see the landscape fabric on the top. Well, that landscape fabric is covering a bed of gravel and it could be several feet deep where this, these parking lots run in there and then that acts as a storage area. And then you can see these plants were then planted on top of that very successfully. So they can work very successfully. I'm just saying there are places for these, these different structures and for using kind of a engineered versus a non. So in these swales, this is a very engineered system, very attractive. You're gonna maintain this just like you would a perennial bed. Well, if you've maintained perennial beds, you know they're labor intensive, which is what you're seeing here on the right. That's how that has to be maintained. A little more natural swale is like this, right? Same gut, gutter cuts, but this area was seeded and blanketed and it was seeded into a native mix, which you see at maturity here on the right. So the water comes in here, the riprap breaks the uh, velocity of the water, and then it filters and cleanses before it goes into the downspouts. But it's more of a natural mix. Maintenance is actually a little bit lower once it gets established because we don't have to worry about all the one plant variety here and another plant variety there. It kind of mixes. And as those natives get nice and thick, they keep most of the weeds out. So again, you know, two different choices, but native swales are another great uh, stormwater best management practice. Conversion of open turf. If you looked on these, uh, this upper two pictures, it's the same area. On the left near the parking lot, we have a mowed strip of turf, and then we've killed out the grass and converted it to what's now a low profile prairie there on the right. That area was too small for an athletic field or anything else. It was just being mowed. Well, why mow an area that's too small to be used for anything else? Why not put in a nice prairie that gives you other environmental benefits and you're not mowing it all the time? So that's another practice that helps on our overall watershed absorb and filter water. Conversion, this is a pond bank on the lower picture, a detention basin that was turf, and the bottom is just degraded Phragmites. This basin actually will bounce all the way to the top of this basin. This basin is 25 feet, maybe 30 feet deep. And it collects water off the roadways and off of all the parking lots around this. And it actually fills 30 feet when it rains. On the right are those banks after about a year after seeding. So no longer needing to be mowed. And I'll show you some other pictures of this bank later on. So conversion of turf areas, I think is one of the biggest areas that we should consider. Turf is now our number one crop in the United States. We spend more fertilizer and water on turf than we do any other crop. That is not a sustainable practice. You can use native plants for a pond forebay to filter out the pollutants before they go in. This is just a very small one that went into an HOA basin. Uh, I think it was actually designed as a forebay and either was never planted that way or filled in with sediment. Whichever it is, we cut through that little channel, created a small four bay, planted it with native plants, filled with frogs and little kids playing with those frogs within the first season. Naturalized pond banks uh, provide beauty in the summer and in the winter. You can see in this upper picture, the gradation of plants, right? If you start at the water, you'll see emergent plants growing up out of the water. You'll see wetland plants along the edge of the pond and you'll see you know, the pond bank plants, and then you'll see the prairie plants further in the back. 
So these are those bands of plants that are growing in habitats to which they're adapted. And that's kind of the philosophy that we've taken now with planting these. We try to take those native plants, grade them based upon wetland coefficients, and use the wet plants where it's wet and the drier plants where it's drier, do our best to get a seed mix. We broadcast that entire seed mix. And then the plants that like to grow in those micro habitats will grow in those micro habitats and the ones that won't, don't. If you were to plug all those areas, you'd be deciding which plants to put where. You might put them in those micro environments that they don't like. You might get a much lower success rate. And that's why I prefer the seeding whenever possible. The wetland edges, we certainly do use plugs because you can't seed very successfully underwater. But, you know, that's one of the reasons. So that's how we go about it and why. And, you know, the lower, the lower picture, the natives also can provide functional value in the winter. You know, this particular property used to have turf up to the driveways and every winter he would put up a snow fence. The facility manager would put up a snow fence. Once the natives matured, he no longer has to put up a snow fence every year. We just leave the prairie plants up through the winter. And as the wind blows in from the west, the snow drops out in the prairie before it hits his driveway. And then these are pond banks and edges that are converted and shows you a little bit of how we went about this. This is a park district. Upper left photo is a degraded pond bank. It was planted in turf, but over time, the plant, the banks start to degrade. The mowers don't want to go down there because they don't want to fall in the water. And so then weeds and weed trees grow up. So all the vegetation you see there is non-desirable plants, years worth of non-desirable plants. They were cleared. You can see the soil being graded. The pond water looks very calm, but believe me, this is a big pond and it gets very wavy. And so you'll see on the lower picture, we use a core blanket, coconut blanket on the lower part, straw blanket on the upper part. On the lower right, you'll see the core log along the water edge. So if you do have a lot of wind motion or wave motion, and or if you're trying to get emergence established along the water edge, we use a core log so to ensure that those plants can get established without being damaged until they're established. And then the snow fence is put up to stop um, human beings from trampling the plantings until they can get established. So it's not the geese. This isn't for geese. This is for people because the you know we get people that always want to fish around these and they trample these with their dogs and themselves and so forth. So we put snow fence up and we take it down. If, if this planting was done in September, we put the fence up and we take it down the following 4th of July. That gives it one full season and one spring to grow. And by that time, your natives are hardy enough that if people walk over it to go fishing or whatever, it'll spring back. So, you know, that's kind of how we do the, the pond edges. This is the same pond edge, same from the same place. You'll see the early spring. This is a May picture in the upper left. This is a uh, July picture in the upper right. And then this is a September picture on the lower picture showing the grass. So you get a succession of color, texture, movement. And if you look at the upper left picture, you'll see the turf grass that hasn't been mowed, All right? That was reestablished and we did our seeding, but when we took down the fence, the mowers never mowed that. So you want them to mow right up to your natives. You don't want them to leave that buffer or else that's where you get a lot of weeds. And if you look on the upper right picture, look right next to the water, you'll see those yellow um, cone flowers, right? And then you'll see that kind of green band and then you'll see the monardas. Well, that green band is the wetland edge plants. Those are sedges and rushes growing in that lower wet area where the monarda and so forth are growing in the upper drier areas. And then a variety of grasses in the fall. So it's, it's such a beautiful alternative to what was there and has so many benefits. I can't understand why people wouldn't use it. Here's a conversion of a dry bottom basin, another BMP that you can use, a lovely dry bottom basin, but the community wanted some native areas. Again, you know, these are people in the community requesting passive areas for pollinators to bring, you know, birds into their neighborhood. And so, I mean, it's a great basin. It was well-maintained. It looks really pretty. That rolling hills is nice. Could not be used for, you know, any active recreation. And so it was converted. We killed out the turf. We, we then um, broadcast the seed, hardly raked it in. This is a cover crop in the first summer. 
And then this is at the end of the first summer, we put a little bit of cosmos in our seed mix to give it first year color because otherwise sometimes if you know if we don't get some black eyed susans the first year people think that you know the owner just stopped mowing or they say oh it looks terrible it looks worse than it did when it was mowed every year so we put a little bit of color to get people to buy into it right away if you look below the native establishment sign and your screen is big enough you'll see native seedlings growing there. Right below the sign is a purple coneflower. Off to the left is a yellow coneflower seedling. You know, there's black-eyed Susans in there. And further in there, there was sneezeweed growing. And so that's what we're trying to get with the first year. We're trying to get those native seedlings to establish. There has to be enough sunlight to get down to the seedling, but enough shade to keep the weeds out, you know. And so that's kind of the mix that you're trying to get. So if it's too thin, you're going to get a lot of weeds. If it's too heavy, the natives aren't going to emerge as well. And then this is the second season in the spring. You know, it looks a little ratty in the spring, but by the fall, you know, the, the, you'll see two colors here. You'll see the brown upper band and you'll see the yellow in the lower. The upper band that's brown, you'll see a few of those cosmos came back, but that brown band is actually all black-eyed Susans that had already bloomed and died down. This is in September already. So there was a beautiful band of yellow all around this basin all summer long. And now in the fall, that sneezeweed had come in because that was a wet bottom seed mix with more wetland loving plants. And it was gorgeous with yellow later in the season. So all season long, it now had color and beauty and habitat for birds and bees, you know, and butterflies. So it accomplished in, in you know, three years what we wanted. So you have, a, you have a choice of what to plant your areas with, but you know you could go with low profile native mixes. And I would recommend that in the built environment, you probably don't want tall grass prairies in places where people are close to them or they're close to buildings. You wanna go with low profile uh, prairie seed mixes. And so that's what you have here. You got a lot of forbs. This is the same pond bank in the spring. And then in the fall, you know, change of color, change of texture, very attractive, low profile mixes. You could go with heavier, and, and that's mixed grasses and forbs. You could go with heavier forb mixes like you might see here, kind of a wet bank prairie with the liatris, wet edge with the rattlesnake master, swamp milkweed, vervain, sedges, rushes, or an upland dry prairie with the more of the monardas, purple cone flowers, coreopsis, um, false sunflowers, milkweed, things like that. So you can have, you know, native Ford dominated if you select that in the seed mixes. So that's an important thing to do. And unfortunately, a lot of the seed mixes aren't, and a lot of the seed mixes that are used or that are specified aren't always that great because the people who are specifying are taking a boilerplate spec and not, and not customizing it for your particular uh, location. And then more of a native grass, you'll see this, see this more in the fall. So you can see that nice golden band around these ponds. And then as you move from the left to the right, you'll see that high flat plateau where it's mowed turf, the contrast between that and your golden native grasses. Then you have that sedge uh, rush mix. It's a little bit greener. And then you kind of have the wetland emergent plants as it goes down into the water. So it grades all the way down into the water, helps filter and cleanse that water, helps to stop bank erosion. And then your lower photo is more of your taller um, dark green rush and then taller sedges and things like that, but also grow in wetter areas that are considered grass-like plants um, when you consider what type of plants you want to see and what, that you want to use. So what's the process then of getting these established? I'll move along a little more quickly here. Um, this is a basin, a, 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 it was supposed to be a turf bottom basin, but really turned out to be, as you can see in the lower right, very wet. You can see the rut marks where lawnmowers had gotten stuck. And if you look across the far end of that basin, you'll see where the inlet is and it comes across that basin. And over the years, they tried to channelize this. They cut a straight line to try to get that water to move from the in, inlet to the outlet. Still didn't help, still couldn't mow this during most of the year. So this client was able to get a grant to re-meander that, to make it a serpentine flow through the bottom and turn this to a native vegetated bottom. And what would the benefit be? If the water has to go further, it has a chance to slow down, the sediment can drop out. It has a chance to go through more native plants. It can be cleansed. 
and it can also be cooled as it does that. So instead of coming with dirty water shooting straight across us and moving downstream, now the water that leaves us is cleansed, cooled, and filtered so that as we as a state try to keep making our rivers and streams cleaner, converting turf bottom basins into native bottom basins is one of the ways that we can do that right at the source that can really help to create cleaner water in our streams and our rivers. So first we kill the turf. Then I had a grader come in and re, you know, do this up on the upper left. Unfortunately, this spring, this was two, two or three summers ago, it didn't dry out until July. And so the crabgrass grew in where we started to kill. So we had to actually come in and re-kill the crabgrass two days before we seeded. And we came in and we spread seed. We spread it by hand because there were three different varieties of seed in this basin. And then we hardly raked it, scarify the surface, work the seed into the soil surface. And because it was July, then we covered it with a blanket to protect that seed until it gets, until it germinates. And we never irrigate or water any of our native plantings by seed. We let it rain, we let them come up. We have a cover crop in there and they're fine. You don't need to water these when you, when you seed and blanket them. And then this is September. So we seeded in July, three months later, this is what was there. This is mostly um, seed, a little bit of the cosmos coming in but not blooming yet. You'll see the serpentine flow of the water and you'll see a couple of posts. We planted this in two stages. We seeded it first with three different, we, with a prairie mix, a wetland mix and an emergent mix. In those lowest areas where you see they're wet and brown, we then came back and we put some uh, emergent plugs in these areas to help um, cleanse and filter the water a little bit more in those posts or goose protection that we put in. So, you know, this was a, a, a very good, very uh, good results for one year. Part of the reason I believe this turned out so well so quickly is because of the quality of the soil that was in this basin. This was a 30 year old detention basin with a lot of good topsoil in the bottom of this basin. This was not new construction that was scraped to subsoil and then covered with six inches of compacted topsoil. And so, you know, you get much better results where you have good soil. And then this is a before and after the same before picture in the upper left and an aerial view where you can see that new serpent comes through and I'm pretty confident that as this gets established and some of those emergence and those settlement basins, you know, we put settlement basins at the inflow and outflow too, so that any sediment would stay in this basin and not flow. I think over time, as some of those emergence, you, you'll see that algae go away. And then this, this is a fall seeding, which I just wanted to show you. The spring seeding, you know, we can do as I showed you to get those nice colors the first season and so forth. This is a September, early September planting. Three weeks later with the cover crop up, goes through the winter. First spring on the left, this is actually July of the first year in the upper left. Not so nice looking, you know? So your fall seedings can sometimes look a little red. But by the end of the first year, this is what we had down on the lower right. So at the end of the first year, it looked nice, but in the spring, my client is saying to me, Bill, are you sure they're gonna grow? It looks pretty bad, maybe you need to overseed that. And I'm looking at it and thinking, yeah, you know, she might be right. But we did, we put a little extra seed, but that's not what you see growing here. The natives did come through. As long as, as, long as that cover crop that you saw in the previous picture is up, you know that your native seed made it into the soil and will come up as well. Just have to be patient. Natives take three to five years to establish. And in the natives where that haven't been in for three years, I actually have one client who tells me, Bill, you gotta be patient because it'll come. And by five, by year five, it's beautiful. So but anyway, this is year one. This is what you can expect year two with a good native seeding. Okay, spring and then in the middle of the summer. And then this is year three, what you can expect, you know, once the natives start to come in, they're just, they're just beautiful but it does take a little bit of time, you know, for them to come in. So the left, lower left is kind of a, a bank, a pond bank with um, um, 
butterfly weed. I hate, I hate it that we call these natives milkweed and butterfly weed because they're not weeds. You know, there's prairie um, clover in there, purple prairie, prairie clover. You know, there's a little bit of um, penstemon. There's some coreopsis in there. Yeah, it's just beautiful stuff by year three coming in from seed. And then this is the prairie areas up top all growing by year three. So, you know, those are what you can expect as you put them in. So let's move on to maintenance of native plants. You know, you can't, you can't not maintain these. You don't run to fail, right? If you put a new air conditioner in, you're certainly going to maintain that air conditioner. It's the same way with native plants. Man has always been involved with his environment since the day of creation. And so we have responsibility to steward and to keep these areas in good condition. 95% of our service of our country has been disturbed. There's, there's you know, weeds blowing around always. If we do nothing and just say, oh no, just let the land heal itself, it's not gonna heal itself. The non-desirable stuff is gonna take over. So they're self-renewing as far as dropping seed and growing again, but you know, we impact the environment. And so we have to also steward and maintain the environment so it doesn't degrade. So a basic program is really selective herbiciding or selective cutting from April through September during the growing season. That's really the core of your maintenance program. Then there's fire, there's spring cutting or mowing if you can't do fire. And then you have project work, you know, maybe there's some reclamation work or something. And then you have your management practice at the end. And all of these are important, right? That management practice at the end is just as important as the selective herbiciding and things. Because if you don't manage and get the money to do them, then these things aren't going to be done. We're managing these in the built environment and people have budgets to work with it. So you got to consider that as important of a tool as selective herbiciding or selective cutting. And so you'll see the graphic down below. You'll see some fire. You'll see a spot herbiciding, a little bit of overseeding. And um, you know, once the natives come up, you can collect and redistribute the seed in the weak area. So in October, you can go out or when, you know, if there's certain varieties earlier in the season, but at the end of the season, you can collect a variety of plants and then broadcast them in your weaker areas and over time help to fill in and start to crowd out the weeds. Best weed control is a nice native growth. All right, so then the question with some of these are, and here's a, a sample management plan. If you have seven sites down the left, you know, what the prescribed burn might be, what the woody cutting might be, selective herbiciding, and then maybe some project work comes up to your total budget. This was a park district, your municipality. And if you have a budget cut because of COVID or something that comes up, you go back and you cut out 25%. You say, we're not gonna do the planting seeding this work. We're not gonna do the selective woody cutting. We're gonna drop that $5,000 out of here. We're gonna run it $20,000 because of our budgetary constraints. And then when the revenue comes back up again, then you put some things in. But you use a tool like this to manage your overall plan. So what are the frequencies? of maintenance visits, that depends. The younger it is, the more frequent it needs to be. You have three types of weeds, annual weeds, biennial weeds, and perennial weeds. And so you can, you can kill the annual weeds by stopping the seed cycle. So you could mow that. And the new seeding, you can mow your new seeding a couple of times a year to prevent it from going to seed. Your biennial weeds, you can stop by cutting. Your perennial weeds, you have to spot herbicide. And weeds will express themselves and they drop seed at different times of the year. If there's something dropping seed all, all seven months of the growing season, then you ought to visit it seven times a year. By the time the natives come up and start to squeeze things out, okay, we can cut that back to five times or maybe four times a year. And by the time they're 20 years old, we can probably get it down to two or three times a year if we have to. So maintenance frequency depends upon how problematic the weeds are in your native area. How frequently do you Everybody you talk to will tell you something different. If you can do it, burn it every year. It's a good practice. If you can't do it every other year, if you can't do that, do it every third year, but I would do it at least every third year if you can. And then some of these other things are if you're bidding out the work, you know, considering these things, do you need a performance bond? Well, only if you're a state agency and you're getting funding and it includes construction, do you need performance bonds if it's above a certain dollar amount. It doesn't require prevailing wage to professional services. And then you probably want to include some type of a monitoring report so you know if your natives are actually improving or not. Most in DuPage County and a lot of the other counties in surrounding Chicago area, the local ordinances require annual monitoring and uh, an annual report until they meet establishment criteria and they get sign off. And after that, you don't have to do the annual reports. 
So at minimum, you've got to do it the first three years. And then after that, just if you want to know if they're continually improving, then you can include an annual report of some sort to monitor what type of plants are growing there. So kind of in summary, you know, these are not natural areas. They're created native planting. So modify your seed mix. Try to get the plants to grow in habitats to which they're adapted by selecting the right seed mixes and putting them in the right place. Consider your soils and then realize it's going to take three to five years for establishment and then realize that you're in the built environment. And what do you need to do to accommodate that? If it looks trashy, it's going to get treated trashy. Don't let residents dump in here. Have some kind of a policy that you send notification to people that you're fi you find who are damaging these native areas. If it's in a park district or an HOA, these are common properties. All the taxpayers, all the homeowners pay into these associations. There's no reason why one or two people should be damaging this. They need to be stopped and they need to be notified and then they need to be fined if they don't do it and they need to pay for the cleanup. Uh, you know. And then, you know, our natives are an important part of the water treatment train. Water's not a waste product and it does require um, maintenance. So I really think, you know, that more natives, the use of more natives is our future. You know, this is the growing turf and ornamental plants is not a sustainable future for us. So we need to think about ways that we can beautifully and thoughtfully incorporate more and more of these practices. I mean, it doesn't make sense to put a tall grass prairie in your front yard if you have a small front yard. I don't advocate that at all. You know, I, I would much rather see a small mode lawn in the front if you then have all your beds planted with natives and at the right heights and varieties and thought, think through that, put your native, taller natives in your backyard or less people might, you know, be, um, um, you know, been out of shape about it, you know, and we can still accomplish a lot and draw these birds and draw these insects into our beneficial insects into our yards. And, and it's not just this, we, if we would just use a native plant palette instead of an ornamental plant palette, we can bring birds and pollinators and, and all these things that we're looking to into our environment. So we need to consider those. So native plants aren't as widely used as they still should be, but we've come a long way. And I appreciate each of you for being involved today and for being part of making these changes. So with that, Jamie, we have a little bit of time. We can open for questions or however you'd like to handle it. Yeah, we do actually have some really great questions here. Um, first off, Michelle would like to know, what seeding rate do you recommend for starting a native plot? Okay, so um, the native seeding rate is going to depend upon the, the seed mix that you have, right? The pound, they usually rate them based upon pounds of live seed or ounces of live seed per acre is how they do it. So if you look at the seed mix, different seed mixes are going to give you a difference. So I won't give you a pound rate, but what we typically do in our new seedings is we, we purchase our seed from Cardno in Northern Indiana, local genotypes from there. And then if I need to, I have them customize our seed mix. And um, I'll typically use one and a half times the recommended seed rates. I also have the um, ryegrass removed, the, the, um, not the native rye, but the um, uh, cool season rye removed. It used to, the annual rye used to be in there to hold the soil, but we're finding that some of those ryes are too aggressive and they keep growing and they crowd out the native. So I have them take out the rye grass and then I just buy seed oats locally and I add an extra 50 pounds per acre of, of seed oats to my mix to help to spread it, but also to give me a little more of a cover crop. And I add a pound per acre of Cosmos so if you can convert that to smaller quantities, hopefully that'll help you out a little bit. Great. Uh, Hope would like to know, how do you kill the crabgrass? I know that's right, a so big that problem. Drawing I showed you, right. If you have bare ground in June, you know, when it warms up, crabgrass is going to grow. So we, we just killed it out. Anytime we do these seedings, we do a total kill. So we use glyphosate, one, one or two applications to kill it. And then we put in the native seed. So that's, we're not selectively killing it. This is a total kill. Okay. And so then Sarah wants to know when you kill off the turf grass, do you then rototill or do any other kind of topsoil amendment? 
That's a, that's a good question. You know, the soils in northern Indiana, if you know, if you know your soils in your locale, that's great. It's good to take a soil test and find out what you should do to balance your soils before you plant them, right? Because if you're going to, if you're going to till the surface, that's the only time you're going to be able to incorporate those nutrients in. Otherwise, you're going to have to top dress them and let them naturally move through the soils and let the plants work them in over time. So if you have the luxury of having an open so soil surface, that would be the time to amend them. In this area, the biggest need is actually for calcium. Even though our pH is up, our pH is up because our magnesium levels are too high. And so if in our area, application of gypsum would be your most beneficial thing. And gypsum can be surface applied as well as incorporated into the soil. Our potassium, our phosphorus levels are typically high enough, but our calcium levels are a little bit low and that's why our soils crack so much in the summertime. So gypsum I would recommend in, in, in our area. You're gonna have to soil test your area to find out. Now to answer your question, once we kill that turf grass, if it's thick enough, like you saw that one turf bottom basin um, where I showed you three seasons of it. That turf bottom basin, we simply broadcast the seed on top of the dead grass and then we Harley raked it. A Harley rake is a rotating drum with spikes on it that pulverizes the surface and it works that seed, seed down to the soil surface and that dead grass then acts as our erosion control blanket. If we then have to come in and put an erosion control blanket over the top of it, it almost doubles our cost. And so if we can use the existing dead turf mat as our cover, we'll do that to keep the cost down. So to answer your question, you know, when we, when we kill the turf grass, we then use that as our surface blanket. And we, we typically don't put any other amendments down when we do this. There's typically enough there. If they've been growing turf and if they've been fertilizing, the nutrient levels are high enough already. Yeah, and I know there's always um, some debate over stirring up the mycorrhizae and the, the beneficial soil bacteria and all of those kinds of things that if you till, you can disrupt all of that that's been building up in there too. Right. So, great. That's right. Yeah, that, you're right. I mean, that's, and that's the benefit of, right, no-till gardening, right? No-till farming. Excuse me one second. <laughs> uh, yes, our pups. The dog from barking. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, and then another question here, and this is kind of a general for people who maybe aren't in the industry and aren't as familiar with it. Um, so why do we do prescribed burns? That's another good question. So the, I think the question, I'll answer that question, but I would also say the first question is, do prescribed burns have to be done? And the answer to that question is no, they don't have to be done. You can mow instead, but you want to do one or the other. And why would that be? That's because if you start to get woody, woody weeds in your natives, they're very hard to control. So the burns help to control the woodies and mowing also does that. Annual mowing, if you're cutting down to eight inches towards the ground, you're cutting off those larger woodies and then you can spot herbicide them to control them. Native, native woody plants like oaks, when they get older, have a thick, cambium on them and they withstand the fire. So historically our prairies used to burn, but the prairies were so full of, of grasses that they would burn very, very hot and they would boil the sap in those woody stems and they would burst those cells and the woodies would die. And so because those prairies burned very regularly, you had very few woodies growing in them. And so we maintain we do the same thing, right? So we burn to do the same thing. We use it to control non-desirable plants. A lot of the Eurasian plants that have come in won't withstand the fire. And then we also use it to recycle the nutrients that are in the, in the top growth and to, and to help stimulate some of the native plants also use fire to scarify and to break the seed and to germinate. And so there are those different reasons that we burn if at all we can. And, um, it's just part of the natural cycle that's always been, you know, of native plants and in the natural environment. Yeah, and obviously, you know, it's something that if it's a homeowner, it, you know, you have to be very careful with that kind of thing because obviously right. you don't want to burn your house down. Um, no, and that's why, that's why I say if you can't yeah. burn, don't. I mean, if there's any risk, don't burn. Yeah, exactly. We, we do the same thing. We do it for a living and I'm not going to risk melting somebody's house. I'm going to mow it instead. 
right. You know, I, I have a small rain garden, but it's far enough away from any structure. We're very careful. You know, we have the hoses out there wetting down the, all the area around it. We wait till it's not windy out. You know, people who do these kinds of burns are, are trained. There are trainings that you have to go through, like through the state to do it. And so it's, it's good to have an idea of what you're doing before you're going to you know, take on a project like that. But um, on the larger scale, hiring a company to do that for a municipality or a forest preserve or something like that, they're very, very beneficial for helping to keep the weeds out. Um, so comment here, uh, an anonymous attendee says, based on my experience, the monitoring needs to be done more than twice a year, which is typical. Seems like it should mirror the maintenance visits too many times after a monitoring visit that invasives had taken over and we need to start over. Any thoughts on that? Yeah, I agree 100%. <laughs> <laughs> it's pretty, pretty hard to take two snapshots during the during the year and, and see what's going on. You know, different plants grow at different times. Like this person said, you know, the the weeds, the weeds that express themselves could express themselves three weeks after that visit was made. So I agree. Yeah, I, I do too. And I know um, we monitor some sites and yeah, definitely only going twice a year can be very difficult. A lot of things can change in that time. Just Yeah, and I would only season. say, you know, that's, that's, that's a financial issue, right? I mean, Absolutely. the two visits and the annual monitoring report are financial. If they had to make a visit seven times a year, you know, at the same time we do maintenance, then their cost would be the same as the maintenance cost, you know, so it's a financial issue. Yeah, absolutely. I, I know in a, in a couple of instances, municipalities like park districts, you know, will actually sort of befriend the neighbors. And if you can do that and have neighbors keeping an eye on the property, neighbors who, you know, know what's going on, that's always a good way to do it too. Um, okay, we've got a couple of issues here in this question. So I'll, I'll read the question, then we can kind of break it down here. Uh, Jackie says, I'm looking at seeding three areas, one along a timber area, two ditch areas, and three over a clean septic field that was recently put in. There are layers of rock and sand in this area with soil overlay. Will the native forb or low profile mixes work in all of these areas? Should I do a soil profile on the septic field area? Well, I think you have a pretty good idea of what's there already. I mean, the natives will grow if you, they, they will grow in all those areas. So Let's see, you said three seeded areas, one along a timber area. Okay, so that's a woodland edge, right? And there are woodland edge seed mixes mm -hmm. that you can buy. Cardno carries one, right? There are ditch areas, right? Storm, either a stormwater or a swale mix for the ditch areas. And then a clean septic field that was recently put in, uh, layers of rock and sand with a soil overlay. So that would be kind of a, maybe a, prairie mix if it's fairly dry and I would just add you know decent mix of legumes in there to give you a little bit of nitrogen because once it breaks through that soil level you're going to level you're going to go down into that sand a little bit more which is nutrient deficient so I just make sure that you had enough nitrogen fixing plants in that mix to continue to sustain the other plants over time that's all so I, and most of the prairie mixes do have some legumes in them partridge pea and some uh, lupines and things like that in them. So there are seed mixes that can address all three of those areas. Now, my question is with a septic area, I have heard mixed um, reviews on, on what to do with that. I've heard some people say that because the native plant roots can go so deep that it's not really advisable to plant natives over a septic field because you don't want them getting in there and, and kind of disrupting that septic field. Others say, no, it should be fine. Any any experience on your end? Well, the only experience I have is that where the soils are very nutrient rich. So if those nat natives hit that septic field, they're going to be very lush and green for their whole life. You know, it's going to be a very tall native area for a long, long time. Because typically what happens is once your natives fill in, they actually get shorter because they start to compete for nutrients and space and sunlight. So your established prairie is pretty tall and then it gets smaller over time. All right, excellent. Um, and so another question about, or a series of questions here about HOAs. And 
I think, you know, I, so it says, what do HOAs need to do? Are permits required? Do you need prior approval? Who are you sending monitoring to? Are there parameters listed for monitoring? And is there a template to follow? A lot of, okay. a lot of questions. Are all good questions. <laughs> I yeah. think. So, so I'm, I'm, pres I'm presuming that this, this is a turf basin that you want to convert to natives. So if you're converting turf to natives, you can just do that, right? You don't, you probably don't need special um, permits and all that kind of stuff. You can just do that. And, and by you, you, you mean the HOAs. If you're in an they're HOA, right. They're re the HOA's representatives, not just a random resident going out and doing it on your own. Yeah, I mean, if, if you, if the HOA board decides that they wanna convert their pond banks from turf to natives, it's permissible to do that without permitting. The place of permitting is needed is if you're changing the shoreline banks and typically if you're going to be affecting wet areas, in this case you're not all you're doing is changing the vegetative surface and what you're really doing is you're improving that and making it more function more functional than the turf was. So you don't need typically you don't need special permits for that or prior approvals. And so if that's the case, then nobody's going to be requiring that you do a monitoring report, but you know if you're doing a new planting. The monitoring report is required by the local local governing body that is responsible for stormwater management in your locale. That could be your village, it could be your county. And so that's who it gets turned into. And typically they hold a, if you're required to do a monitoring report, they typically hold a construction permitting bond and don't release it until your planting meets establishment criteria. And they said planting shoreline, not turf. And I think what, what we're referring to is we're referring to those shorelines that are turf. So shorelines that are currently grass that's being mowed all the way down to the edge. Um, and so putting back in some native plants, removing that turf, removing that grass, and then putting in these native plantings. So we, we are talking about the same thing here. Yeah. Um, and the question question about the checklist I, I gave that maintenance checklist it's on one of my slides you know what what are the what are the items that should be in, included in a maintenance checklist and natives is is there you know you might want to add checking your drains and making sure that they're clear and picking up trash but other than that those bullets that i gave you for maintenance are there on one of my slides if you have that in a pdf or something and you sent it to me then i if anybody wanted it, I could send it to them if that's sure. something you've got. Okay, so yeah, so if anybody wants that checklist, let me know. Um, oh, and she said she screenshotted it, so that's good. Um, okay. But if if you want that in a PDF or something, let me know, I'll get it uh, and I can send it out to you. So um, if anybody has any other questions, if you need help with your homeowners association, if you want help doing something like this, if you want somebody to talk to your HOA board um, about, the benefits of doing this just let us know i have done that on numerous occasions um, and i'm happy to do it again so um, definitely let us know we here at the conservation foundation are always here to help and we don't charge for those services either so um, we don't do the work itself but we can always put you in contact with bill or we can help you find somebody in your local area who can do it as well so um, let's see if we've got um, all right, I think that is all the questions there. Yeah, okay. And then just the one, my email is bill at bedrockearthscapes.com. All right, well, thank you so much, Bill. This has been great. Always so much wonderful information as usual. Very much appreciate you helping us out today with our webinar. And thank you to all of you for joining us today. Uh, we do appreciate you uh, following along with us. Remember to follow us on Facebook to find out what our upcoming webinars are. And as I mentioned earlier, keep an eye out for all of our Earth Day activities that are coming up as well. Lots of really, really cool stuff coming up. So with that, we're going to close out. Thanks again, Bill. Thank you to those of you attending today. Thank you. And we will see you next week. Take care, everybody. Goodbye.